Top of the morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Hope you feel like we're starting to get ahead. I am looking forward to getting ahead. Thanks for tuning in. Colin, Fraser, Dan, Paul. Walkman, how are you? Let's see if we can find Trevor. Michael. Let's see if we can find Trevor. Thanks for tuning in. Brian, Trevor, there he is. Here we go. Here we go. Connecting. Trevor, top of the morning. Hey, how's it going, man? You good? How you doing? I'm very well. Uh, you know, considering what everybody's going through, uh, having to stay at home and and uh, sort of separate ourselves from our normal lives. It's a crazy time all over the world. It's uh, It really is, isn't it? Who would have thought it? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've always done traveling around the world so much is I'd often find myself, let's say I'm in Tokyo or something like that. And I would, you know, at some point think, oh, I wonder what people in Cape Town are doing, or I wonder what people in New York are doing. <laughs> and you, because you always know, like, okay, it might be calm where I am right now. Or let's say I'm in for, on a safari in South Africa, for instance. Yeah. And you're like, man, it's so peaceful here. But like in New York City, it's just going crazy right now. Yeah. And that sort of always amused me how, you know, big the world is and how everybody's up to their own thing. And now when you think that, you realize everybody's doing the same thing. We're staying at home yeah. and yeah. not, not uh, you know, trying to do the right thing and be safe. So it's really weird. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around at times. But obviously, you, uh, you know, it's been, it's, uh, it's, it's been a brutal so time. It's so strange. I said to my wife, I said in week one, I was walking around like a headless chicken without a plan. Then week two, I said, okay, I've got to have a plan. And so I, I set too much for myself each day. Mm. And then week three, it's almost like I'm starting to get used to it. I hope that mm. as we start to get accustomed to this, we actually can move out of it mm. and start to get to a, a level of no normalcy. Trevor, what are your thoughts? I see the PGA uh, put out a schedule yesterday. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I uh, was pretty excited about it. If, I was if, and, and if you go one week earlier when they put out the schedule for the majors and the FedEx Cup and stuff like that, uh, for me, it's exciting right now. We've had so much bad news and uh, all over the world that to finally have something that as golf lovers, you know, at the very least, that we can sort of grab onto and see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel, the powers that be are able to... Um, see their way out of this and start they're obviously collecting all the data from all over the world from all the different yeah. organizations and so it's exciting for me you know whether it sticks or not sure uh, and 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 uh, and we're able to get out there and play some golf is another thing but at the very least you know we've got something that we can look forward to here come june a little bit of hope mm, yeah you know you you sometimes one of the things that I've learned through this process is it's so easy because we're all so busy with kids and careers and whatever else is going on. It's so easy to lose perspective and appreciation at times. Yes. And, uh, you know, when you go through something like this, and we've obviously been very fortunate that we've been healthy through this process. So never mind some people yeah. that have, uh, have had a really, really tough time, but uh, you know, you start to appreciate some of the, the little things that maybe just fly by in a normal day. Yeah. So uh, that's something I, I definitely have top of mind right now. And Trevor, talk about appreciating perhaps not a little thing. I see that your parents are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary today. I know. That is a very special thing. Congrats. Yeah, yeah I know. It's uh, so proud of them. Really cool. Actually, it was yesterday. Oh, was it? Okay. And uh, I texted my mother last night. I said, just out of my own interest, you know, was, was the first 50 years, um, you know, 
compared to the last month, which was tougher, having to be locked down in a house with my dad, you know? So having a little fun with him there, she she got a good giggle out of that. But uh, yeah, uh, really, really proud of them. 50 years, they're here in Orlando, live about 20, 25 minutes from me. So um, that's that's an awesome effort right there. That's super cool. That really is great. Hats off to them, mate. Well done to them. Yeah. Um, Trevor, you've obviously been playing golf a long time and you're a fellow South African, you know, just as I am. And I wanted to touch base a little bit with you and just get a sense of, as you started playing, I've coached so many golfers that have said to me, oh, the, beyond a doubt, the greatest swing ever in the history of golf is Trevor Immelman. And, um, you know, can you give us some insight as to, as a junior growing up and who your influences were and, and just how it all came to be. How did you get to the PGA Tour and, and how did that work? Whew, that's, a long, that's a long story. <laughs> that started when I was five years old and I'm now 40. So that's a long story. But grew up in Cape Town, uh, which is, uh, as you know, for some others that are listening, it's the furthest southernmost tip of Africa. Yeah. And it was an amazing childhood. Uh, had lots of access to golf. I grew up at a, a local... A uh, public golf course called Somerset West Country Club. Okay. And I mean, a massively windy part of the world. Yeah. And so, you know, being a little guy growing up in very, very windy conditions, that's, it, that was the thing that, you know, formulated my swing. I had to find a way playing against older people, whether it be juniors or other members at the club, had to find a way to really compress the ball to get it to cut through the wind, you know, yeah. particularly with some of the old golf balls, yeah. uh, and be able to then get some distance and even maximize the distance with some run on the ball uh, off the tee, particularly with Kikuyu fairways. Yeah. And so, you know, that really was how I learned to hit the ball. And, uh, you know, then over the years, when I was about 13 or 14, I ran into Robert Baker. Okay. Uh, through a mutual friend, Johan Rupert, he introduced me to Robert Baker. And I came over to Orlando and spent a summer here with Baker and with David Ledbetter. Yeah. Uh, at Lake Nona when Led still had his academy there. Yeah. And that was just how things started to progress and slowly but surely started to, you know, find my niche a little bit with my swing. There were some things that, that had to be refined. Mm. Um, and really throughout the majority of my career, before I blew my wrist out, uh, I just, you know, used to play some kind of a straight shot, maybe a bleeding uh, fade, but couldn't draw the ball to save my life. And, really? uh, oh, never could, never could. My draws were always pulls. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, so I would aim right and pull it. And then my mind would say, okay, that was a draw. But if anybody else that was standing right there would say, oh man, you just pulled it. But, uh, <laughs> So that was the way I played. You know, at, the interesting part is one of the interesting things about being competitive is you're always trying to get better. And then you see other guys out there that you think are really good yeah. and you want to mimic things that they do. And so, you know, as I'm turning pro, I'm playing with Ernie and, you know, guys like Adam Scott and Tiger and, you know, guys that could hit the ball so high and draw it. Yeah. And it was so funny because at the time I was like, man, I just, I wish I had that, but I don't have that. I can't do that. It's not my game. Mm. And uh, it's so funny because now I can draw the ball and now I wish I could go back and be able to hit that, <laughs> hit that straight, <laughs> straight shot with a little bleed on it. So yeah. it's one of the things that is tricky for a golfer. I would think so. You got to be, you got to be very careful where you start searching and how mm. you go about it. Uh, in order to make sure that uh, it's still manageable out on the golf course. Look, at the end mm. of the day, the, the goal of any change is to lower your score. Yeah. Uh, not make anything look pretty or, or not. Sometimes even having an extra shot, type of shot in the bag doesn't lower your score. So True. it's one of the tricky things. But that was part of my upbringing was growing up in very, very windy conditions. And that's how I learned how to really hit down on it and compress it yeah. and be able to squeeze it out there. That's interesting. I always remember seeing a video of there's that pass that goes up and around Somerset West and trucks coming around the corner and the wind just blowing every truck over like it was <laughs> nothing, you know. 
Um, I know the wind can blow yeah. in Somerset West, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah it's no sure. joke. It's no joke. It's, uh, you know, when that southeaster comes through there in the summer months, in the winter we would get a lot of rain, but we would still mm. go out there and play. Uh, not crazy cold to where you couldn't play golf, but uh, in the summer, man, it's going to blow 25 miles an hour. You can you know, oh, bet your on house a on it day. Yeah. every single day. So if you want to play golf you, and, and play well, you better find a way to be able to flight the thing through the wind. Yeah. yeah. You know, Trevor, that point you mentioned a minute ago, I would think particularly for a young player, getting out amongst those really great players or players that were about to become great, yourself included, it would be difficult to, to be that young player with eyes wide open and see these different ball flights and go, wow, I've got to do that. Instead of staying true to yourself, I would think that would be quite a challenge. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's, it's so tempting. Yeah. It's so tempting. I grew up playing the majority of my uh, golf with Adam Scott. I'm still okay. great friends with him to this day. And you talk about a supreme talent when it comes to ball yeah. striking. I mean, since we were kids, this guy had the ability to have a, a mega shallow angle of attack um, throughout the bag. And it was just so tempting to want that. Uh, it yeah. was like a forbidden yeah. fruit that you would just yeah. go to bed and you're dreaming about it. I mean, you'd watch this guy hit three irons where – you know, like Tiger back in the day, they're not disturbing any turf and they're picking this thing off of the ground. It's not skinny. He hasn't had it skinny. Yeah. I mean, it's the strikes high in the face, but there's no divot and they're able to just launch it way up there and land it soft. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's extremely ten tempting to want to chase stuff like that. Yeah. But you, you got to be careful. You, you got to yeah. stick to your guns. That's why I admire guys. You know, like you look at a guy in, who's played great over the last few number of years. Let's call it a decade, really, even. A guy like Matt Kuchar, you know, yeah. or even Jim Furyk would be another one. Those are two yeah. guys that really understand what makes them good. And they stick to that formula. Mm. Um, and, and I'm not knocking their ball striking in any way, shape, or form. I mean, Jim They're Furyk's, good players. Yeah, Jim Furyk's one of the best players that I've seen from a standpoint of being able to move the ball both amazing. ways and mess with the trajectory. Yeah, amazing. Uh, it just doesn't have the power like some of these guys that we see now. Uh, but those are two guys that I admire from a standpoint of they know what they've got and yeah. they, they're able to take that game to a particular course, figure out how it's going to fit in there and mm. still be a factor week in and week out. For me, that's also something to admire. True. That, that, that really is true. I remember... They should be, well, they should be playing Harbour Town right now. And I've got to tell you, it is the most perfect day. The guys who teed oh. us late yesterday, early today, are, have just hit the jackpot. But there's yeah. no one playing. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was always one of my favorites because it felt so good to be able to play at Augusta. It's obviously a massive build-up and yeah. you're working your ass off and getting ready. And then, you know, you drive down the road a few hours and you get to Hilton Head and everything just seems to calm down a little bit. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it was always just such a fun week for the, the family and kids loved it. And uh, what a golf course. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it really is such a fun golf course. I watched Jim Furyk play a full 18-hole final round out there one year. He didn't, I think he finished second or third. But mm. I'll never forget on the fifth hole, which is a par five, he hit this lovely rope hook off the tee, <laughs> intentional. And then had a hybrid to the green and hit this beautiful high cut, you know, about 15 yards of cut to the middle of the green. And I thought, wow, that's impressive. You know, there's not many players out there uh, who, can, who can do that and really control their ball to that degree. It really was a great show to watch. Yeah, uh, that, that, that was the second shot that I was always just trying to keep my ball away from that out of bounds. It's about, yes. three, it's about three steps from the edge of the green. Yes. It's one yeah. of the narrowest greens in the world, that. Yeah. And, and if you miss to the left, yeah, if you miss the to the left, too. there's no way to get it up and down if you miss to the left. So you've got to be able to – and there's a tree in front of the green. Yes. I mean, good grief. But uh, what a golf course that is. That, that, that course has stood the test of time right there. It doesn't really have to get much longer. Yeah. And, you know, you get a 10-mile-an-hour wind around there, particularly on those par threes. It gives you fits. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible how – Every year, it's like 12 to 14 under wins. If you can shoot 12, it's 6,900 yards, 12 to 14 under wins. 
if you can score that around there, you're going to be right there. You're going to yeah. be right there. Yeah, the greens are also kind of tricky because they're so flat. Yeah. So, so small, first of all, if you're on the green, you've got a good look at birdie. But they're so yeah. flat and you get a little bit of that grain coming in. can be tough to read because yeah. you're always sort of looking for something and uh, it messes with your mind a little bit. True, true. Trevor, tell us a little bit about, I know, you know, I loved, I was so excited to see 2018 Scottish Open. You're right in there. You finished third. Fabulous results. I'm thinking, okay, come on, Trev, you're back. You're back. Talk to us about, you got any thoughts about playing still? What's, what's on the agenda for you? Uh, no, not really. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I've, I've uh, dove in full time here with the, the TV work that I thoroughly enjoy. Yeah, I uh, still love to play golf uh, and, and enjoy getting out there. I've got a 13-year-old son that loves the game and he plays yeah, for the cool. high school team. So we get out there and play when I'm home. Uh, but, you know, the last number of years have just been tough for me. You know, body st struggles to put the work in that is needed. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that people don't maybe quite understand is it's not like you just pitch up to a golf tournament and you know you unpack the clubs and you have a quick nine hole practice round and jump in there and you know making million dollars of a, a week you know that that yeah. that is nice if that's yeah. happening and for some players it is happening you know we all have a window that that we play our best yes. golf in but uh you know there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes for and sure. i just got to a point in my career where i had to weigh up uh quality of life from a family standpoint, yeah. the amount of work that it's going to take for me to just be able to manage some kind of game at the highest level, as well as the opportunity that I have going forward with the TV. And, uh, you know, with where my body's at, I just felt like, uh, you know, there's probably going to be less starts going forward and uh, more time with a microphone in my hand. And so, okay, obviously you've got this, you've got this opportunity every year. And no. I'm going to get to commentating. I want to talk about that. But you've got this opportunity every year, Augusta National, April. When do you start preparing for that? And I know you're a proud golfer. We all are. You, mm. you, you've got to start thinking about it game-wise, practice-wise, pretty early in the year. Yeah, well, when, when you're playing full-time, it starts right around January time. You know, yeah. when you're out on the West Coast, particularly for me, I was out on the West Coast and I'd already – in every warm-up session, every practice session, I'd be trying to coax a little draw every now and then. Yeah. There's a few tee shots there where you definitely do need it. You know, obviously, like we all know about number 10. Yeah. And, uh, but over the last few years, I've had other stuff that I've been doing. And uh -huh. so the, the process would start a little bit later. Actually, funny story. Bay Hill week this year, yeah. uh, Adam Scott came over for dinner. And we were sitting outside having a beer and I was like, he was like, so you're going to play at Augusta? And I was like, man, I think I'm going to, but I haven't hit a ball in a few, few months here. I better, I better yeah. get to it. So we were, we were having a laugh about it and starting to see what my schedule could possibly be so that I could not go out there and totally embarrass myself. So I was actually going to play uh, in the Dominican Republic a couple of weeks before okay. down at Punta Cana. And so I was going to get one start under my belt, you know, to feel the heat. It's, uh, idea, yeah. it's, a, it's a total different sport, let me tell you, between uh, yeah, practicing sure. at yeah. home and practicing at the venue is a different sport. And then another total different sport, having to actually compete and hand a scorecard in. So yeah. uh, I was going to get one start under my belt. I was going to be able to practice that week. I was going to practice one week before and then the week after and hopefully be able to go to Augusta. Okay. And uh, and run into a little bit of form. It's pretty much what I did uh, last year, and yeah. I managed managed to make the cut there. Uh, and uh, so we'll see. The beauty about Augusta is I obviously know the course so well. Yeah. And I know exactly how to play the course. There's there's a there's a a real strategy to playing that course, and I I, I know that. So it would have just been whether I could execute in the moment to be able yeah. to keep it around par and make the cut and see what happens on the weekend. And Trevor, take us, take us through a little bit of that 2008, that final round. If I remember correctly, I remember sitting here watching it with my dad and it was so cool. We loved it, yeah. but it was, it was a tough day. It was a tough mm. day. I think four players shot under par. Um, one player, the mechanic shot 68. 
uh, in the top 10. And, you know, mm. that vaulted him up the leaderboard. But it really was a tough day. And uh, I looked over your scorecard earlier this morning just in prep for this. And you played a great round of golf. 75 might not show it, but mm. you kind of locked it up and then said, OK, let's get this to the house is what it looks like. Yeah, in a certain way, it, it was to my advantage because it was so blustery. It, it yeah. was just exactly how I learned to play the game. Yeah. And and learn to just hang in there and, and fight your way for every stroke that you can save. And so the mindset I was very accustomed to that's needed to play well in mm. those kinds of conditions. But yeah, it was a very nervy start. Uh, I bogeyed the first. Yeah. And, and then uh, made a great birdie on number five that really settled me down. Yeah. It's a very, very difficult hole. And then I hung in there a little while. And uh, guys really started having a tough time around Amen Corner. A couple of guys dumped it in the water. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was just able to hang in there. Yeah. And uh, got through Amen Corner. I bogeyed 12. I made a great save on 11. I bogeyed 12. Uh, didn't want to hit it in the water. So I blew it through the back into the pine straw. Anyway, I made a pretty good bogey. And then uh, birdied 13 to get that stroke back. Very cool. And got through 15 uh, and uh, I guess had what a five-shot lead. Had a five-shot lead at that time. Didn't know it. I knew I was doing well because when I walked across the Sarazen Bridge on 15 after, after hitting it on the green, I got a standing ovation. And that only happens pretty much for, for past champions at 15. Yeah, you're being anointed. Yeah, so... I was like, oh, this is different. You know, normally uh, this doesn't happen. So I knew I was doing well. I got to 16, got the usual back left hole location. And wind is really pumping off of the left there. We played 15 straight into the wind. Okay. And so, you know, my usual shot, like I said, it's either a dead straight ball or something that's just going to work its way to the right. And uh, going with the seven iron. And I'm aiming straight at the flag because, you know, yeah. hardly 99 times I'm not going to miss it left. Yeah. Uh, and I guess because the wind's so hard off the left, I've just turned the toe down. Yeah. And it's, I've hit it so damn solid and yeah. it's obviously flighted down. And I'm, as I hit it, I was like, oh, no, this is just not going to bleed. Yeah. And so I'm basically at that point just praying that this thing is going to get in the bunker somehow. Yeah. Because if it misses the bunker, it's quite a steep bank. So I'm hoping that I've caught enough of it to get in the bunker or go long left, like yeah. where Tiger chipped in from. Yeah. And it didn't happen. And the first thought that went through my mind was like, "Oh, what have you done? Like, what you've what you what have you done? You've just you've just thrown this thing away." And so that was the first thought that went through my mind. And then straight away, I was like, "Okay, what are my options?" And the yeah. drop zone is at the end of the tee. And so dropped it, hit a nine iron on the green and two putted. But now, like I'm in severe panic right now, you know, mentally severe yeah, panic. Yeah, for sure. sure. And uh, you're just trying to keep it together. I actually had a pretty good look from about 15 feet or so to save bogey. But my mind is spinning and I just blocked this thing way out there. I knew it was breaking from the right. And tapped in from a few inches for double. And as I was getting the ball out of the hole, I got a standing ovation again. Oh. And I was like, Gee, this is weird. Like, and obviously, you weren't looking at scoreboards, eh? No. I, you know, I would look and I would see the names, but I wouldn't see the numbers. It was just okay. how I trained myself. Earlier on in my career on the European tour, I had a, a few opportunities where I would watch the scoreboard. Mm. And I always felt like I would blow it because when I was behind, I would play too aggressively mm -hmm. and screw it up. And yeah. when I was ahead, I would play, you know, too defensively and screw it up. Yeah. So eventually I was like, this sucks. I got to come up with a new strategy. I'm not even going to pay attention. I'm just going to play every shot, you know, on its own merit. And like believe, it's Thursday. Yeah. And believe that you're good enough to win. Yeah. And so I did that. It had worked in the past. Uh, you know, I had won a few times leading up to that. So that was still my goal. But at, when I got that uh, standing ovation walking to 17T, I was like, okay, well, you must still be leading. So yeah. it was a good opportunity to say to myself, right, just refocus here now and see if you can pass 17 and 18. 
Yeah. And so in a, in a way it's sort of me up a little bit to refocus me yeah. and uh, fortunately hung on. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah. I must say we're, that was a great day in the rice house. Yeah. As it was, in, it was a much bigger day in your house, but we loved it too. We loved yeah, it, it was too. a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And Trevor, talk to me, talk to me about uh, commentating. CBS, you're, you're on the squad there. Um, I, I love the crew at CBS, the lineup at CBS. Ian Baker Finch is a friend of mine. He's and um, how do you feel about that? I, I, I mean, obviously you're happy, you're overjoyed about it, but mm -hmm. what's difficult about it and what do you really enjoy about it? Well, the thing I most enjoy is being part of a team. You know, yeah. as a pro golfer, that's just something you well, don't often get. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the same reasons why, you know, I've loved opportunities in President's Cups or, or different things like that is because you just very rarely get the opportunity as a golfer to have somebody who, who's going for the same goal yeah. and have a teammate like that. And so that is the part that I, I enjoy the most. Um, you know, it's a lot more challenging than what a lot of people would realize. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot going on. You know, when you, when you sit at home watching golf on the couch, a lot of times you can be like, man, this is moving so slowly and, you know, what's going on. But when you're actually a part of the process of, of the broadcasting, you realize how it's moving so fast, Andrew. It's, it's hard yeah. for me to even explain to you. You've got people talking to you in your ear. Yeah. You're watching live golf. You're watching uh, a monitor at times in case a shot needs to be played on tape because there's so many balls in the air. You know, you, yeah. you, you're yeah. going to miss something and going to want to replay it uh, for, for the people watching. And so there is so much going on that you're paying attention to. And then you have to bear in mind that as an analyst or commentator, or whatever word you want to give it, yeah. uh, you have very little time to actually say something for the most part. You know, yeah, a lot yeah. of occasions, it's only two or three seconds. Yeah. And so when there's that much going on, sometimes trying to find the right thing to say uh, that is meaningful can be a challenge. Mm. And so, uh, you know, those are the things you, that you've got to watch out for. But once again, for me and my personality, that's one of the things I've enjoyed because it's, it's like learning something new. You know, I've been yeah. so invested in, yeah, I've been so invested in playing golf for since the age of five yeah. and just immersing myself and my whole life in, in trying to get the ball in the hole as fast as possible that for me to actually have to learn something new and understand it better and try and get better at it. That's the process that I, I really enjoy. And that, that was what I enjoyed when I was playing was just spending time practicing. Yeah. Uh, and that was, that was one of the reasons I, I, I beat my body up so bad is I would just practice and practice and practice and practice. And uh, you, it, the wear and tear eventually catches up to you. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, that's the part that I've loved, man. Just, ha you know, having that new challenge where you, you, you're coming into it so fresh with open eyes and you start to pick things up here or there and yeah. then try to put it into practice, maybe take a risk every now and then and see how that goes down. Yeah. You know, yeah. go, go, go on the old Twitter and, and see, okay, but how, how did that go down? Um, <laughs> put something and, and, out there. Yeah, you start, you start to realize what works, what people enjoy and find your little niche of, you know, what, what's my spot going to be for the next, 15, 20, 25 years that I'm, yeah. I'm going to try and do it. You know, and interesting listening to you talk about coming down the stretch in 08 and you're striving for calm in the chaos. And mm. you, you had prepared your whole life for that moment to mm. be calm when everything was coming undone. And I think commentating is not that different. You've got to be calm and normal and just eloquent mm. whilst all this other stuff is going on and there's someone in your ear and this one person's just hit it in the water and and there's so much going on and you've got to be calm and just just speak nicely you know? yeah well also uh just like golf you've got to have a lot of trust you know it's a large team from yeah. technicians 
cameramen and women, producers, directors. I mean, there's so much going on behind the scenes. What it takes to put golf on your TV. Yeah. Not many, very many people have an appreciation for that. I sure didn't when I was playing, let me tell you. Mm. I had zero understanding when I was playing for sure. what yeah. it takes to put a product like that out on TV. And so you have so many people just working their butts off trying to make sure that this goes down without a hitch. And so, yeah, trust. You've got to throw trust in there too. You've got to trust your team. You've got to trust everybody who, who's got your back and, uh, and, and trying to get it done. It, it, I, I got to be honest with you. I get the exact same rush from doing TV that I did from playing. Really? Hey, that's Ab interesting. Abso absolutely. I, 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 can, I, I must say, I, I can see that. Absolutely. I can see that. I can mm. see that. That's cool. That's cool. I like to hear that. Trevor, talk to us about President's Cup. I must say, as someone who's had the privilege to play golf in Australia and play Royal Melbourne, I know you've played it. You've been there a number of times. Mm. Just to see that event and to get that event in primetime US TV time and sit down every night after dinner and go, okay, let's go. <laughs> it was fabulous. We, we loved it. We invited a bunch of friends around. We had all kinds of bets going on and it, it was tremendous. We really, really enjoyed it. And what was that experience like and, and what you got planned for us coming up for the next President's Cup? Yeah, it was, it, it was amazing to be a part of that team. Uh, you know, Ernie, who's been a mentor of mine yeah. uh, since I was a very young kid, uh, was such a good captain. You know, he was, he was, every, when you have somebody that you look up to, a hero, let's say, yeah. okay, you, you just always hope that they're going to stack up to be the person that you thought they were. Yeah. And he superseded my expectations from that standpoint that week. That's such a great thing to say. He, he was so charismatic and so um, he was calm and he was authentic. Uh, but he just found a way to give everybody like a little jolt and, and bring them into the moment. Yeah. Um, he just absolutely aced it. And we came so damn close with a so team close. with a team that uh, has got a lot of talent, but we were so young. You know, we had seven rookies out of 12. Yeah. And we had the youngest team in the history of the tournament. You know, we had two guys that were 20 and 21 years old in, in M and Neiman and a bunch of other youngsters in the early 20s. And uh, we came so close. I mean, we gave these guys that are, yeah. The the uh, the who's who of golf right now. We gave him a good run, uh, and and came so close on Sunday. Ran out of a little, ran out of some juice there on Sunday. And all credit goes to them. They they played really well when it mattered. Yeah. On Sunday. Uh, and uh, so it was a tough defeat, you know. We yeah. We felt like we had a great chance on Sunday. And, uh, and came up short. And uh, as an athlete, that's always a very bitter pill to swallow. Not, you know, it, it's hard to be a gracious loser uh, when, yeah. you build, when you build yourself up to really wanting something that bad. Uh, in the moments right after defeat, it, it can be a very, very trying time. Mm. Uh, because you just want to go and sit on your own and sulk for a little while. Uh, but... Even that, I thought the youngsters handled beautifully. And uh, it gave us a little bit of hope for the future. I mean, we've been beat up so badly in that yeah. tournament over the years. Yeah. Uh, and gave us a little hope for the future. So for me, uh, now being named captain, it's, a, it's such a proud moment. Um, and uh, I'm extremely humbled by that appointment. And I'm looking forward to it. You know, I think our team is going to be have a great blend of, you know, some of the guys that are a bit more my age, like Scotty and Louie and guys like that, yeah. who have tons of experience and, um, you know, are still a force in the game. Matsuyama is another one. Okay, he's not anywhere near my age. He's still a youngster. Yeah, yeah. But he's been around so long with so much yeah. experience at the highest level. Um, you know, you throw guys like Leishman in there. You've got Jason Day that unfortunately couldn't make it because of a back injury. 
but then you start looking at some of these youngsters coming through uh, from all over the world, the Ms and Neemans and Cameron Smiths of the world. Um, you know, these guys are legit great players. Yeah. And so I think we're going to have a lovely blend of, of experience and youth that like that excitable youth. That's what we enjoyed in our team room yeah, down in Australia. Uh, you know, these guys are just so up for it. They're up early every morning, texting everybody, and, and, and they're just so pumped at the opportunity. And uh, so it, it should be a nice blend. Look, it's going to be it's going to be a massive mountain to climb to beat yes. the Americans in America. But uh, all you ever want is a chance, you know. That's, that's what sure. all of, it's what all of us ever want is just a chance to see see if we can do it. If, if you don't, you take your hat off and say well done. But if you do, it's something you remember the rest of your life. Yeah, I I thoroughly enjoyed the Presidents Cup. Uh, I thought the golf course came across so beautifully. Oh, you yeah. played all over the world. What what golf courses do you like? If you if you could. If you could only play three courses for the rest of your life, I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit. Mm. Which ones would you would you love to play? Yeah, that that is a tough one because I haven't played some of the greats, uh, and so I've only seen them, read about them, stuff like that. But my style of golf course is 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 much more old school, yes. and and what I mean by that is not too many man made hazards or what we call them now penalty areas yeah um you know that's why i love place like riviera that's why mm. i love a place like royal melbourne it's just it's just there mm. and there's other ways for it to be super challenging it's one of the reasons why i love augusta national too uh you know you think of a few of the holes like 12 you know 13 15 the holes where there's some water. Yeah. You could lose a ball there. But other than that, it's quite hard to lose a ball at Augusta True. National. Yeah. And the old course would be another one another one like that. Some of these old link style courses you look in England, Scotland, um and, and Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh you know, you can go a day without losing a ball and still shoot a massive number. Yes. Uh and that's the kind of golf that I like. Okay. Um so I'm always sort of edging my way to that kind of a style. I'm with you. Old school. I like old mm. school. Yeah. I like yeah. old school. Okay, Trevor, come on. We've, we've got to talk a little bit about golf instruction. You've worked on your game for a long time. You've always had connections with coaches. You've worked with a bunch of different coaches over your career. Uh, give us some insights as to what you feel regarding the state of golf instruction at the moment. Uh, what are your thoughts pertaining to what's good and what we as the golf instruction community, obviously there's golfers and golf coaches watching, uh, what we can do better? Ooh, um, there's a lot of questions in there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you can pick whichever one you want. <laughs> um, you know, I think the state of golf instruction is pretty strong right now. Uh, I think in the last dec or decade or so, the tools that have become available to golf instructors uh, really have helped uh, fast track, in a way, some of the learning. And so there's a little bit less experimentation needed now. Uh, yeah. And I think that's why we see so many youngsters coming out on tour and and competing at a very very high level straight away uh you know a little less experience maybe is needed now from some of these youngsters coming out of uh, amateur golf or or collegiate golf uh because the learning process has been able to be so swift in their teens yeah and also i've found just by observing uh the way they play and the interactions with the coaches they work with is that uh, nowadays it appears to me that stuff doesn't necessarily get changed because it looks a certain way. If yeah. you're able to get out there that. and play and, you know, your coach gets you out and uh, puts you on, uh, you know, flight scope or something like that, and you're able to just nail the numbers all the time, but 
you know, your head looks like this at a dress, or you've got a mega weak left hand grip, or, you know, let's think of someone like Jordan Spieth, who's got the yeah. weak left hand grip. He kind of cocks his head a little bit like Nicholas and Faldo used to. He rolls his left ankle. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of coaches 20, 30, 40 years ago, those would have been the things that they might have tried to change. Whereas now, uh, if a kid comes to you and he's 10, 11, 12 years old and he's got something a little different going on, but he's got, you know, 115 mile an hour club head speed and you ask him to hit a draw and he matches it up perfect and you ask him to flight one down and he matches up perfect, you're going to be less likely to tamper with that. Yeah. And so to me, that's one of the advantages of what I'm seeing with where golf instruction is right now. Uh, but, for me, one of the things that I think coaches can get better at right now is coaching much like playing to me. I see it like, like a pizza or like a cake. Okay. And, and there's a lot of different slices to it that you need to form the whole pizza. Yeah. And in order to be a good golfer, right, for instance, you've got you to gotta be able to drive it well. You gotta, nowadays, you've got to have power. And you've got to be able to, you know, have a shot that you can rely on under pressure that's repeatable. You've got to have a good wedge game. You'll be able to flight the wedges down. You've got to be good out of bunkers, all that kind of stuff. You've got to be a good putter. You've got to have a good mental side. You've got to be strong and fit so that your body doesn't break down. So you got, let's just say, seven or eight different pieces of yeah. the pie here. Yeah. And I think now if you look at coaching, you've got to be so careful because I, I can tell you from experience, you can get lost in instruction. Sure. And, and the technical side of it. And I would just urge coaches to make sure that they're working on the other pieces of the puzzle as well Yeah. that revolve around being a great coach. You know, how do they motivate their players? Uh, how do they understand the personality of their players? How to get the best out of them? How do they communicate uh, in a way that different students understand and are able to get their bodies to move in certain ways? When do they need to be tough? When do they need to back off and be loving? Like there's so many different pieces of the puzzle, not just the technical aspect. Yes. Uh, it's so easy to go on the range and just get lost in... Swing, swing, swing. Being able to hit up on a driver and launch it at 14 with, you know, 2,000 spin. Like it's easy to get lost in stuff like that. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily make a great golfer. And True. so what I would love to see from coaching, I'm not saying it's not happening, but what I would like to see coaches More. get get better yeah. is finding that whole package that you can fit together. And that's why I think you've seen guys like Butch and Ledbetter and and guys like that. They stood the test of time yeah. over over a long period mm. because they're able to to come at things from different angles as well, not just – from a swing technique standpoint. Yeah. You know, I chatted with Grant Waite, who I, I, I'm, I, I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, he's Grant, a great guy. Grant made a lovely point. He said, when you're coaching particularly better players, you've got to look at it and go, everything you say comes with a cost to it. That's so and, true. And how you say stuff and what you say, you've got to weigh the cost first before mm. even saying it. And mm -hmm. so, okay, we need to, you know, I, I, was, I also was talking with Foley uh, the other day, and he said he started working with Brandon Grace, okay? And so he looks at Brandon Grace's swing, and he says, Brandon, I'm going to need two weeks. I'll get back to you in two weeks <laughs> after looking at his swing. Because he, was, he really is uh. so aware of, I don't want to say anything, because a lot of what Brandon does is not what Sean's looking for. And so Sean's like, okay, I just got to bite mm. my tongue and I got to kind of get right. out of here. And I got to look at this and go, let me assess and let me look at this and study this player, look at their statistics, get to know the player better, and then go, okay, this is where we're going to go and this is how we're going to go about it. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. And, you know, one of my best friends, Chris Como, who I've spent a lot of time with, uh, we, we've sat and had some of the longest, most in-depth conversations about all sorts of things, but golf in particular. And we always talk about
about how, you know, invariably a player at that level if, or when they're coming through, let's say, they're going to get better just by continuing to play. Yes. And through experience and understanding their game. Uh, and so, yeah, that's where it gets very, very tricky for a coach. You know, you've got yeah. to be so careful with what you say because uh, or what, what, how the player interprets what you're saying even. Mm. You know, there's been a lot of advice that I've been given over the years that was dead on. But the way I interpreted it in my own language, in my own understanding, and then tried to implement it in my swing wouldn't have worked for me or didn't work for me yeah. at the time. And so then you've got to discard that. But now you've just wasted uh, you know, that time where you could have been doing something else and getting better. And the other thing, actually, that, that uh, you know, Grant Waite was instrumental in, in teaching me, I've spent a lot of time with him, is um, when you change one thing, invariably something else is going to be changing with it. True. And a lot of times the student isn't aware of that at the time because they're just trying to match things up because, particularly at the highest level, I mean, I know exactly where the sweet spot is. And it doesn't matter how out of position I am on the downswing, like I'm going to get that sweet spot to the ball for the most part. Yeah. And so the, the, the things that I'm going to possibly have to change to get that sweet spot to the ball is just going to create a disaster with that kind of swing uh, yeah. and, and that kind of speed, excuse me. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's a tough job. It's, a, it's absolutely a tough job that doesn't get, get – uh, you know, maybe enough credit that it deserves uh, because you like to focus on the areas where it doesn't work out in relationships between player and coach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a tough one, tough one. The, the, uh, I'm actually teaching – I teach a great young player here in Savannah, fabulous kid. He's 15 years old. We've worked together for a couple of years, and he's just good. He loves the game. He's a, just a great kid, great family. And I said to him pretty early on, and I said to his dad pretty early on, I said, guys, listen, my objective in working with you is not to mess you up. <laughs> That's my first objective. Yeah. My second objective, and the picture I painted for them was when you took your, your young kids bowling for the first time. You know those bumper lanes That's that right, they, can, yeah. they can put up? I said, I'm the bumpers. Okay, I'm yeah. not necessarily going to tell you what part of the lane to go down, mm -hmm. but I'm just going to make sure you don't get in the gutter. Mm. And that's the role I want to play as, as a coach, particularly when I'm working with good players, is I don't think that would be a good thing for you to try right now. Mm. Let's just work on, on this. Let's understand our numbers. Let's understand statistics. Let's, let's get a little better with our equipment, our nutrition, our fitness, those kind of things. And... Uh, I really, I think that's a good image for especially young coaches to have when they start working with somebody who comes to them and they're already an established better player. Yeah. I also think something that, that the coach needs to figure out early on is the most important thing is that the student at whatever level understands their own swing. And when I look back at my career, that's something that I would, I would uh, change is when I was playing my absolute best, I was so focused on trying to <clears throat> change particular things that, that I didn't like about my own swing or that I had insecurities about, about my own swing. Yeah. That even though I was one of the better players in the world at the time, I didn't actually understand what was making me good and what was making me able to hit the shots that I could hit under pressure because yeah. I was too focused on trying to get somewhere else. Mm. And so for me, that's one of the things that when I look at my children, how I try to parent is, you know, you, you just guide them to a particular area and then you let, let them sort of mess around in that area and Explore. figure out for themselves. Yeah. Like, okay, it, it's like when we went skiing uh, a few months ago, you know, I, I, the, first, the only thing I said to them was like, listen, you're going to fall get ready to fall. And it's good to fall because that's how you're going to learn how to do it. Number one. And number two, okay, these are my parameters. When I did this last time, it didn't work out so well. So I'm going to yeah. stay away from that. I'm going to do a little bit more of this. And so to me, that is the best way. The student has to understand their swing 
inside and out so that when they do deviate, which is inevitable, they yeah. can easily find their way back to that home base and to what the blueprint was uh, because they have such a unique understanding for, for their own game and what makes it work. True, true, true. Trevor, when you were playing, when you were, like, like you said, playing your best, what role would you say your mindset played in your ability to play your best? Uh, you know, obviously we've got the technical side and, and all of that, but mindset's got to be massively important, I would think. Uh, well, if, yeah. I mean, if mindset is the right word or not, who yeah. knows? Uh, the way you go about uh, thinking about your game, uh, the way you react to certain situations out there, I think that is extremely important. Once again, I feel like a, a lot of emphasis is always on trying to be positive. Mm. And I think it's hard work to always try to be positive. <laughs> and so, uh, yes, it is. You, you know, like you can really grind yourself out trying to be positive all the time. And then you beat yourself up. Well, why am I thinking negatively? And I always found it so interesting when I was playing that how often I would feel mega insecure over a shot and thinking I'm going to hit it in the water or hit it out of bounds or whatever, and you end up stiffing it. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, wait. And then there's other times when you feel so confident over it and you're like, oh, this is money. You know, the wind's out of the right. I can just hit my normal shot. I got perfect club. And you're like, hook it into the bunker or something like that. Yeah. Um, that was always interesting to me when I was playing. And one of the things that I learned later on in my career is to just go with a flow from a thought process um, and, and, and just understand that it's going to be some kind of roller coaster that you're going to have to work your way through. But just understanding what makes you tick and being authentic to that, yeah. I think is so important. You know, you look at different athletes over the years, like the McEnroe's of the world, or you look at a guy like John Rahm or Ian Poulter, you know, yeah. in today's game, these are guys that, you know, they wear their heart on their sleeves, they get wound up, and, and that's the way they can compete their best. Yeah. And so to try and get John McEnroe to act like Bjorn Borg or vice versa, we might never have heard of those guys. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, once again, when, you, when we talk about the mental aspect of the game, there's always things you can learn. We're always learning from our whole lives. But just understanding what makes you tick and what gets the best out of your own game is the most important. I was a guy that I had to be super focused and really in my own bubble and selfish and just an absolute pain in the ass, to be honest. Uh, it's that, interesting that was, you say that, selfish, mm. because I, I, I've been not in a playing capacity, but in a coaching capacity, I've been out there and I've noticed that it really does seem like the players get in their own selfish bubble and I'm not meaning that in a negative way, but mm -hmm. it's just part of what's necessary. Yeah. It's just, you know, everybody's different. And you've got to find that secret sauce for yourself. You know, yeah. look at Ben Hogan and then look at Lee Trevino. Mm. Or, or look, at, look at Seve and then look at Nick Felder. Yeah. And these are legends of the game. And you look at their personalities. You know, Nick Felder is a guy I spend a lot of time with. And I've been fortunate enough throughout my career to uh, play a lot with him. I played a lot with him when I was a junior, uh, when he would come to South Africa because of the hookup with Led. And um, then when I got on the European tour, he was sort of finishing his career over there. And I would play a lot of practice rounds with him. And uh, then when I won the Masters, we share a locker together now in the Champions okay. So I, I see this guy everywhere. And now we work together at CBS. And it's so funny, uh, throughout the time, all the times that I've played with him, you know, he was so locked into what he was doing. Yeah. There were so many times I'd be playing with him and you look over and you could see him talking to himself, you know? Yeah. Like, he was having this conversation with himself about <laughs> playing golf and just do this and that, that. And I was like, look at this guy. I mean, he is oblivious to everything else that is going on out here. And he's having a conversation with himself. And then he would stand up and pull the three iron out and flush this thing, you know, to 10 feet. And I'd be like, this guy, you know, what's going on with him? Yeah. 
And so you've just got to under, learning to understand what makes you tick is, yeah. is I think the most important thing, but also just learning to roll with the punches because mm-hmm. particularly if you're going to play this sport, I mean, how hard is it? There's going to be a few. And there's so many variables. And for the most part, uh, you're just going to get your butt kicked. And so you've got to learn to find a way to just roll with it and, and, uh, and understand those things and keep moving forward. Trevor, I, one word you've said so often today is the word authentic. And that's really going to be my big takeaway is be true to yourself. <laughs> got it. Um, know who you are. Know what works best for you. Find your recipe as a golfer, even as a coach, and uh, stay true to that. Hey, mate, mm. I, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate hey, no your problem. openness. Thanks. And uh, so, so uh, we wish you, I wish you all the best in this. I know it's not starting, you know, it started already, but it's going to kind of start again, mm. um, hopefully here soon. And uh, we will be watching and wish you all the best. Eh? Yeah, I appreciate it, Andrew. It's great to hang out this morning. Hope you're doing well and hope the family's well. And I look forward to seeing you out there soon. Thanks, Ben. Stay safe, Trevor. Appreciate everything, eh? All right, brother. Thanks, bud. Bye.